Hi everybody, I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and we're here again today with Dr. Leanne Leadham. Dr. Leadham is a psychiatrist and a professor of counseling and psychology at the University of Bridgeport. And she's developed a webinar series called Skills, for, Skills Training for Recovery from Narcissistic Abuse, Gaslighting, and Toxic Stress. So welcome, Dr. Leadham, so good to oh. see you again. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this, Donna. You're doing a great service to our community here by hosting these webinars. Great. All right. Well, th there are four distinct webinars in the series, and the last one, you'll be teaching survivors skills of interpersonal effectiveness, um, which would be skills that they can use to help them deal with others, which may sometimes include people with personality disorders or psychopathic traits. So I have a few questions. Um, first of all, why do you think people are shocked and blindsided by the behavior of disordered individuals? Because it violates their long-standing, lifelong models about what it means to be human and about how people are. And part of recovery is learning to let that go. And, and, and it's interesting because the survivors have to deal with so many opposite truths. We call that dialectics. So this is actually a dialectic that we want to let our model go. So that's one truth. But on the on the op, on another truth is that we want to be able to love and trust, and it's my goal for this four weeks to show a path for synthesizing, letting go, and having love and trust. You have to do both. So by letting go, you mean by the way they viewed um, people like throughout their entire lives so that right. it needs to be modified, right? Okay. Right. And, and also noticing how much when you're interacting with someone, you're making assumptions based on that model that's inside of you. And, and that's part of the mindfulness of interpersonal interactions that has to be part of successful recovery. To, to be mindful of the degree to which that model is operating in you and um, coloring all the judgments that you make. So what happens is you have to essentially develop two models, you know, one for regular people and, and one for disordered people. Right. But you know what? I'm going to explain. It's not quite that difficult. Okay. Because as we all know, um, not people who wouldn't normally be inclined to act in an evil way are capable of acting in an evil way under the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it, I think in the end, it, it means a more sophisticated model about um, human behavior and, and the qualities that make a person human. So what do you think then are a few key points that people need to remember about disordered individuals when they have no choice but to interact with them? Oh, then the other thing is, I was thinking about this right before our meeting, that in a way, they have to be willing to do things that they might consider a bit immoral. For example, for example, um, in Judaism, there's this concept called stealing the mind. And, and an example of that would be for me to say, oh, Donna, I really like your purple sweater, even if I hate the purple sweater, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people wouldn't want to do that in their interactions, but being skillful with a disordered person. And the operative word here, interestingly, isn't sociopath and it isn't even psychopathic. The operative word here is knowing how the mind of a narcissist works because it really is those narcissistic traits that color their interpersonal behavior 
So, so to be skillful with someone who's highly narcissistic, a person has to be willing to be a bit deceptive. And, and so it, it, it requires a person to look into themselves and ask themselves what, what behavior of their own they're willing to live with and what, what's their line of deception they're not able to cross and then kind of navigating that. So I think that it's probably not possible to be a hundred percent truthful and transparent with someone who has narcissistic traits the mm. way you would be truthful and transparent to a, a normal sibling or a normal ex-spouse or co-parent or a normal boss or a normal friend or a normal co-worker you cannot be transparent with them in the same way in fact you have to be a bit deceptive in your interactions with them and actually not allow them to see or know what's really going on inside of you. Mm. And I can think of one example where people may need to behave differently. Um, once somebody realizes that they're involved with a disordered individual and they um, want to break up with it, you know, a lot of people have the idea that um, you know, the adult way to do this would be to go and see them and, you know, break it off in person. And I tell people, do it by text, <laughs> you know, because um, it, it's, if you go in person, you're putting yourself in a situation where they may hook you and drag you back in again. So is that kind of an example of how people need to change how they would interact normally? Yes. Um, in fact, it it's fair it it does not violate the fairness principle because by the time most people get to the point we're discussing the harm they have occur incurred as at the hands of the other person is considerable mm -hmm. so compared to the harm that the survivor has has endured the the harm that the survivor is going to inflict quote unquote harm is nothing Mm -hmm. So I would say, especially in your um, example, the only consideration is the safety of the survivor, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so it it also would not be wrong to block the person from your phone, block the person from everything and send them a message somehow saying, don't ever call me again and leave it at that and never speak to them again. Um, so, so, but you know, that might not be right for everybody. It has to be whatever is going to be the safest. It also wouldn't be wrong to just completely disappear, block everything and not ever allow them to know where you are. Mm -hmm. um, that also wouldn't be wrong. Mm -hmm. So safety first and your well-being your psychological and emotional well-being second so physical safety then psychological and emotional well-being that's what should govern the rules of the interaction how can you skillfully achieve that and then of course the well-being of any other people that could be affected by what the decisions that you make mm -hmm. so are there any other mistakes that people may make when they interact with a sociopath or, or someone who has a disordered personality? Yeah. Um, I would say that the con it's not mistakes per se, it's the context of the mistakes. I think most people underestimate the degree to which they have been conditioned and shaped by by a disordered person that they've had a long-term relationship with so long what do i call long term anything more than a year or two um would certainly be long term and then you know but a lot of people have many years mm -hmm. of conditioning so most people um underestimate the effect of that so let me give you just a small research example that's related so if you if you um, ask middle school teachers to um, rate the attractiveness of the bullies in the classroom. They all rate the attractiveness of bullies higher. 
then you take those same pictures of the bullies and you show them to people who didn't even know the bullies and they don't rate them nearly as attractive. And so people that have been manipulative and charming and bullying um, have effects on others that that should not be underestimated. And so, and and that is also with respect to fear. Now, survivors may have a good reason to be afraid for their physical safety, uh, but then also don't underestimate the impact of fear on your thinking. So for example, just because you're afraid doesn't mean that individual is really all powerful. Mm -hmm. And and so the, that probably that would be the number one quality of life damaging um, impact is that this person induces fear. And so the survivor believes this person is way more powerful and way more everything than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And and being free means freeing yourself of those beliefs and trying your best to see that person as they really are. Um, see that person the way someone who hadn't been conditioned by them would see them. Hmm. So in one of the earlier webinars in this series, we talked about operant conditioning uh, as reinforcing behavior. So can you describe operant conditioning? And is it something that a survivor can use to influence the behavior of a sociopath? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so I don't want to be too academic because I, I don't want you know, I am professor, so I don't want people to say, oh, she's a professor, but she doesn't really help me. Okay, so I don't want that. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, so yeah, it's using reward. And I would say, so that's what operant conditioning just means that reward and to a much lesser extent punishment um, shape behavior. So re the thing about operant conditioning is that operant, the, the reward comes after the behavior. Mm -hmm. But I also explained that there's such a thing as classical conditioning, and that's in some ways far more powerful in terms of its effect on the survivor. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, shaping their behavior using reward is um, an effective tool, which often means keeping them off, what do, you, what do we say? Um, keeping them off balance by going against what you might be inclined to do and giving them a lot of praise and letting them believe that they're on top. Um, even if you create kind of a fictional funny thing in your head, um, you know, in terms of a compliment, like calling them Superman or Superwoman or my, my knight in shining armor, or, you know, that's what I'm saying about every person having to ask themselves, how much deception are you willing to use in order to get your goal of safety, security, and, and to be skillful. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, to realize that this person wants most of all to have power over you. So if you can make them believe that they have it, you're gonna be way better off because then they'll stop trying to get it. Wow. So, um, so the idea then is also perhaps not to reward them when they do something that is, you know, offensive or takes advantage of you or something along those lines. Is, is, is that an approach as well? Uh, but you have to realize what about that would be rewarding. Okay. So any reaction at all would reward that. Mm hmm. And so if something like that happens, the best um, way, if possible, I'm not saying this is always possible, the most skillful response is to pretend you didn't notice. Mm. But then realize that that may cause them to do it again. So you might have to repeat that several times. Mm -hmm. um, but just because you're if you react to it at all, 
that's they, what they were doing was wanting to provoke some reaction to you. So any reaction is going to achieve that end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then again, you know, if they had some need that you perceive that they wanted to see you upset, you could even feign being upset if that would be skillful in that situation. I can't really say ahead of time what would be skillful in each situation, but if that would get them to stop pursuing you um, and get off your back for a while, it might be skillful just to pretend that you're really upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me ask you, um, one of the things that I've suggested to people, um, you know, once they realize, and these are people in a relationship, and that they realize that they need to get out of this relationship, but they haven't quite figured out how to do it. Um, I mean, first of all, I advise them, you know, not to say anything to, to the disordered person to, to let them know what they're thinking. And I've also suggested that they keep behaving in exactly the same way. You know, because if you if you change what you do, then their their ears are going to stick up and say, oh, what's going on here? So what, what do you think of, of that? Yeah, I would say not only don't tell the person, I would say don't tell anyone, not even people you think you trust. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know the extent to which this individual has inserted themselves into the lives of everyone around you. And it may be more than you think so. I would just, for safety's sake, I would keep all plans completely 100% private mm -hmm. unless it's somebody that has absolutely no contact with this situation or, you know, no contact with anyone related to this situation uh, because you can't trust that they won't somehow find out. So can you give a little summary of the type of skills survivors will learn that might help them to negotiate and deal with a sociopath? Um, well, I'm sure they're, well, first of all, I, I'm going to every week talk some, some about this issue of being mindful of your own reactions because you cannot separate this out. To be skillful in a situation, a person has to correctly perceive the situation. So we have to talk on an ongoing basis and assess how well are we really perceiving the situation. But then on top of that, there are skills, there are um, several, there are three main skills. Um, how to ask for and insist on what you want if you have to set a limit or a boundary. That's the first one. Um, the second one is how to validate. And that's what I'm saying about um, how honest actually someone is going to be, that mm -hmm. if you know how to validate that that individual um, is, if you think of them like a vampire seeking their na narcissistic supply. So mm -hmm. validation, you can think of it like the narcissistic supply and some really need it and if yours is what's kind of like a food motivated dog <laughs> if if uh, if you know your dog is food motivated you can train them really well well if you know your person is a vampire living off of narcissistic supply you can skillfully learn how to provide that supply and you can probably live in peace and i would say in that would be especially useful in the workplace mm -hmm. oh, okay um, um and then there are skills dealing with keeping your self-respect. Okay. Um, and then, like you said, healthy relationship skills. And in the aftermath of this, trying to define for yourself what you want to get out of your relationships mm -hmm. and what it means to have a healthy relationship. And um, then how do you leave the relationship in a safe way uh, would be another topic. Oh, and... And the other thing is I'm talking about that in this week in, in the emotion regulation webinar series, and that is how do you deal with your own feelings of love and grief? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's part of this too. If, if you don't effectively deal with your own love and grief, then it's hard to be effective in this situation because you're going to have to be effective in any situation. You have to be very clear about what your goals are. Mm -hmm. And if that love and grief are operating, it's always going to add those goals to your list of goals. And therefore, 
uh, prevent you from achieving some other goal that you might have, like getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, Dr. Leadham. Well, this is the, your information is so fabulous and, and can be so helpful to people. So I'm really looking forward to this next program. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for doing this, Donna. Okay, great.